Good afternoon. I'm David Blight, the director of the Gilda Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. And this is another in our occasional and many uh, Wednesday talks, uh, panels, discussions. We used to call them brown bags when we all met in person, but you're more than welcome to, to have your lunch. I still got a yogurt to eat. Uh, I am joining you all from the Beinecke Library. I'm up in the mezzanine. This is not a false background. This is the real thing. Uh, I'm here doing research much of the time. Uh, so I'm doing a few events from <laughs> this beautiful marble palace. And the security people do come around, so I have to have this mask. Once, once in a while, I'll pull it up if I have to. Anyway, apologies for that. Uh, this is a very special discussion we're going to have today with the Yale Prison Education Initiative uh, director and a uh, graduate of that program and a distinguished spokesman of that program. Um, and uh, this is going to be very important. And we're, we're going to also even scheme to get the GLC more involved with the YPEI. Um, and I'm going to introduce our special guest in just one minute. I'm really excited to welcome both Zelda Rowland and James Jeter. Zelda is the founding director of the Yale Prison Education Initiative. She's a Yale BA and then a Yale PhD. She was an art history major here. Um, she first got started, I think, well, I'm going to let her tell you how she first got started on these questions and these issues. Um, she coordinates this partnership between the Yale Prison Initiative and the Connecticut Department of Corrections. Um, she has uh, built this into a, an amazing uh, project, and it is now only growing, and there will be more announcements soon to come about just how it is growing. Uh, and lots of Yale faculty, graduate students, and units around Yale have become more and more involved in the teaching of actual Yale courses for actual credit in at least two Connecticut institutions, uh, one in Cheshire, Cheshire and one in Suffield, and there may even be another. Um, welcome, Zelda. It's high time we did this panel to, uh, to highlight you and your program, and we're about to. And then I'm especially delighted to welcome James Jeter. Uh, he's the founder of a program at Dwight Hall, which is a, an important, old, and famous part of Yale University. He's the founder of Dwight Hall's Civic Allyship Initiative. He's a New Haven native. He's an alumnus of the Wesleyan Center for Prison Education at the Cheshire Correctional Institution, where he spent nearly 20 years uh, incarcerated. At Wesleyan, it, through Wesleyan's program, he completed 20 credited college courses. He's a member of a program called the Lifers. He's worked with at-risk children and youth. He's raised money for food banks and done all kinds of civic work here in New Haven and elsewhere. He's become a, um, an ally worker with the Hartford Police Department. Uh, and there are many, many other organizations that James works with and has worked with, and I believe is, is either now or has been also enrolled at Trinity College in Hartford. And uh, welcome to you, James. It's uh, good to see you again. I've seen you on panels before and now we get to have one here at the GLC. May I just say at the outset, this is an extraordinary and pioneering program where a major university becomes involved with actual prisons to create actual courses in the prisons, except for this past year, uh, where this uh, Yale initiative has had to figure out, or is about to try to figure out ways to do remote learning inside prisons, and that has not been easy, as I think Zelda is about to tell us. They offer courses, they connect incarcerated students with all kinds of university resources and, and other social resources. This initiative also assists with the re-entry of former prisoners into society, back into work, labor, life, family, and they work as uh, not only educators, but also advocates for the 
the previously incarcerated population. And New Haven, as many of you know, is, an, is, a, is a particular site for this. Um, so what we're going to do is do a little history of the Yale Prison Initiative with Zelda and James, uh, some background on this, how it came about, uh, what it is doing, has been doing, and is doing, and will continue to do down the road. Indeed, eventually hear how indeed the GLC itself can, can begin to have some small link and part in, in this project. So uh, with that introduction, I want to hand it over first to Zelda, and I think there is a PowerPoint here that helps explain this recent history, and then to James, too, who will, um, will join in telling us this history of which he is a part. So Zelda, over to you first. Thank you both. Thank for you. Talking. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David, for it. That was um, a wonderful introduction. And in fact, I think I'm I'm going to ditch the PowerPoint and maybe okay. <laughs> talk through a little bit of the origins of this program. Sure. Um, and maybe if it comes in handy, I'll, I'll pick it up a little later. Uh, All right. Uh, yeah. But, um, you know, I, I and also I just want to take a moment to thank you for having us. Um, it's really it's really special uh, to be here with the GLC and an honor to be in conversation with you. Um, and I, I do want to quickly sort of before I launch into it address, you know, where we are this week on and off campus, even though um, I know we don't want to make this a depressing talk. I think we're a, a community in grief this week, um, not just in the wake of the twin pandemics of COVID and systemic racism, um, and of the racist terror and anti-Asian violence perpetrated in Atlanta last week and the mass shootings that have uh, happened in the last week, but we also have lost um, several members of the Yale community this year, including this week, the loss of a member of the college of the uh, a Yale College class of 2024, Rachel Shaw Rosenbaum. And, um, you know, I'm thinking a lot about the idea of the Yale diaspora and you know we're all over the place. We're not just we're on campus and we're off campus. And um, I'm thinking about people taking the time to reach out to their support systems. Um, and you know, this is actually a break day for Yale College, so I'm really encouraging everyone to take the break day if you're an undergraduate. Um, and um, and also just to say, when I think about the Yale diaspora, I think of course of our incarcerated students uh, who are very much members of the Yale community, who are part of um, what happens in Yale classes, who are part of you know who faculty see as the students they're working with, and they're currently incarcerated um, and being served by us in various ways. So um, as to the origins of this program, uh oh, I think. Professor Blight has gone in some trouble at the Beinecke Library. Uh, oh no, okay. <laughs> uh, to our origins, I'm just gonna say, um, like Professor Blight said, I was, um, I'm an alum of Yale College and also of the graduate school. And um, I became involved with the Wesleyan Center for Prison Education when I was finishing my dissertation. Uh, and started uh, volunteering there uh, in their program, which operates at Cheshire Correctional Institution, just you know, half an hour from Yale's campus. And when I walked into those classrooms to work with incarcerated students there, even though I'd been teaching on campus at Yale at that point for a number of years and in various ways as a TA, teaching my own classes, um, I, I recognize that those students there were really some of the brightest, most ambitious, most promising students I, I'd ever encountered. Um, and it was through conversations with them, with these Wesleyan students uh, that, you know, well, they, they encouraged me to start a program at Yale and they said, you know, this is just one program in one prison in the state and it works with a limited number of students, but imagine what a Yale program could do. Um, and they knew not just that it would have a great impact in our state and for students in our state, but also that uh, Yale doing this would really create a national model. It would inspire other programs, peer institutions to start their own uh, prison education programs and to begin to see incarcerated students as members of a student body, as future leaders and citizens. Um, 
And so around that time, I was just uh, bringing this up earlier with Professor Blight, but we started to convene uh, um, some small groups of faculty and undergraduates, graduate students, formerly incarcerated students, uh, to think about what, what, what could a Yale prison education initiative look like? And, you know, kind of with the underlying principle of if we're extending access to, to Yale, what, what is it, what, 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 what would that be? And how would we configure it? And Professor Blight was one of four faculty members who were at, um, who, who wanted to be included in those first conversations. Um, and of course, since then, it's really, it's really only grown. And in 2016, uh, the Prison Education Initiative became an official program of Dwight Hall, Yale Center for Public Service and Social Justice. And in 2018, we were able to offer our first uh, credit-bearing Yale courses through Yale Summer Session to incarcerated students uh, in two different prisons. And the one that uh, has been our, our main site and the one that we've continued to work in is called McDougal Walker Correctional Institution. It's a high maximum security adult prison about a 50 minute drive away in Suffield, Connecticut. And we are able to work with um, some of the most incredible students. We don't, we don't look at sentence length or type of conviction uh, when we're admitting students into our program. And just to give you an idea of the need and desire for classes, um, like what we're offering for our first 12 person seminar, uh, in a prison of 1500 people, 600 asked to be considered for admission. Um, so that's really an overwhelming number uh, and, and you know, devastating that we, in that first summer especially, we, we didn't realize how, um, how much desire there was to enroll in, in, in liberal arts classes. So since then we've offered a range of courses. We have a great partnership with the Yale School of Art and its Art and Social Justice Initiative to continue to offer art classes, not just studio classes, but also theory classes. We've offered philosophy, sociology, English, um, and we're looking to broaden what we're able to bring into the prison, both through courses and through, uh, we do guest lectures when we're when we're in session, we, we bring in faculty from departments and divisions across the university uh, to sort of give students a taste of, of, what, of what these disciplines even look like, you know, um, because a lot of our students have only um, ever been given access to vocational education or specific kinds of training that the prisons imagine are best for incarcerated students. And so bringing in the breadth of a liberal arts education um, is something that we're able to do. We also, we also think a lot about uh, what, what in addition to college classes, contact hours uh, comprises a Yale education. And uh, you know, for us, you think about a Yale student on our campus and it's not just classes, it's library time, academic resources, peer tutoring, academic strategies counselors through the Poorview Center. And so in this last couple of years, we really bolstered our programming, not by not just by offering classes from a variety of disciplines, but also through partnering with the Yale University Library, um, through which we're helping students access library resources on campus. We have um, a partnership with the Academic Strategies Program, and we're thinking about how to work with students um, who have different disabilities. So I'll, I'll leave it. That's kind of the big picture. <laughs> I'll let James maybe throw in. I don't know. Yes, uh, James, please do uh, tell us your experience with this. You are now a product of this liberal arts education. Um, tell, tell us about your story. How did this come about for you? Um, I'm a born and raised in New Haven. So, you know, I've been cutting through Yale campus. I grew up on Edgewood Avenue. I've been cutting through Yale campus to get downtown since as long as I, as long as I can remember walking. Um, so my uh, journey in higher ed and prison began with Yale. Uh, it was undergraduates who were coming in maybe in 2005, 2004, uh, teaching college prep classes. And then um, they graduated. And that program kind of fizzled out and Wesleyan came in uh, about a year later 
And within three years, they had to formula, uh, formalize the uh, uh, actual program, um, which is where I met Zelda um, in the study halls when um, another Yale graduate was running uh, the Wesleyan program, um, Dara Young. And um, uh, I was released from prison in 2016. And, you know, uh, I would say within days of me being home, Zelda, we spoke for the first time and she was like, hey, I'm doing it. <laughs> it's like, um, I want to talk to you about this and, you know, I want you involved. So uh, she's pulled me in since then. Um, and then uh, made me the uh, inaugural Tau Fellow in the program in uh, 2018. Um, higher ed in, in prison. Um, well, you know, I guess the, the simplest way to express what higher ed in prison is, is that uh, higher ed is the only thought process in prison that is really concerned about who you can become. Um, it, it's it's not it's not focused on your uh, this 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 singular moment in your life that has defined you. It's it's more about the possibilities of what lie ahead of you, and um, that in itself sets it uh, uh, directly in contrast with uh, DOC logic and culture. Um, so it's, it's it's not an easy fit. It's not a uh, it's a great fit. Um, if if you're me, if you're if uh, you're a person who wants to understand your capacity, not look at the, who doesn't believe that anything can add to it other than helping you uh, understand exactly what it is and feel it. Um, and so, you know, uh, that that became my outlet. Um, and 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 uh, it it my thinking around it has evolved since my release. You know, um, prior to I went to prison when I was 17 years old. So I, I've been on college campuses, but I've never been a college student. Um, and so um, my understanding of what the college experience was for me was college and prison until I became a student out, out here um, at, at, at Trinity. Then I um, started to realize there were some other aspects of college that were really lacking from the structure of college and prison. Um, and, and, and Zelda has been more than aware and, and conscious of making addressing those uh some of those those, those hurdles um so that way the program though distinctly different in setting and in and in structure because it has to fit into doc it is actually um branded right uh so that it is a yo program that it does come with the same type of re-entry um <clears throat> processes and outlets that students are offered on campus. You know, um, we, no student leaves blind. And so making sure that, you know, the students that are in the program and for that, an extension of the program, we're in a very small state with not many programs. And, you know, having been in uh, at the time, the biggest program, we just, you know, we know a lot of students. So it's not just students in our program, but students in general who we come across that we are creating access, um, college access, uh, the same type of outlets that any student would have um, around employment and well-being and, 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 and opportunities. Um, so it's been, it's, been, uh, it's been therapeutic for me to be able to uh, partake in uh, th those aspects of, of the program. And um, I, I I really think we're just getting started. You know, I think we're 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 still very young and and are are just getting our legs going. Well, James, could I get you to reflect a little more on? You know, we spend so much time in the academy and in education talking about the value of the liberal arts, or we have to, in a world that especially at at the secondary level of education is all about STEM now, of course, mathematics, science, and so forth, and not without reason. But we spend a lot of time thinking about and defending and, and advocating for liberal arts and humanities and history and literature. How, how do you now reflect on what literature, on history, on art? I mean, all these kinds of courses you took what has it done for you? What, what, what does this kind of liberal arts education do for you? 
Well, I'm I'm highly antagonistic against uh, <laughs> against all formal education to be to begin with. Um, <laughs> I, I I think uh, what we give our youth, what I was given from K through 12, is just a construct of my absence. Um, the the history that anchors all of the disciplines that you learn in school. You know, they tell me as a black man that I, I, I offered no brilliance, I offered no heroism, I've offered no patriotism to this country, to the world, you know, I come from, and so um, I, I, I reject that aspect of, of learning for all children because it also teaches your children the same thing about me. Um, and, and so we, we, we through schooling, um, in a lot of ways, continued uh, a lot of our antebellum practices and, and under the guise of education. Um, and that's kind of been my approach to higher ed too. Um, but I would say that what I had to do is in order to say, you know, I, I, I did the, the high school and elementary school and middle school thing. I didn't do the college thing. So before I could have that judgment, I had to jump in and really test, test the waters. And um, yeah, I, I'm still antagonistic. I still think that the majority of the system is still structured in that manner. Uh, but I will say, I will say this, um, you know, I think the the beauty of a liberal arts edu education is that it builds it builds wealth in people. Wealth is in, is a is wealth is built in ideas. It's not it's not built in mathematics. It's not built in uh, uh, you know learning how to be a carpenter, which is all great things. Those are careers. Those are things that can stabilize a workforce in a, in a person's life. But the liberal arts uh, education allows me to imagine and think through not just theories that have pre-existed, but to reject all of them and to be, you know, kind of emboldened to, 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 to re-theorize my existence and, and what's happening and then move from that standpoint. Um, I, and it's completely contrary to, I, I don't just think prison, but to the structure of how our system works. You know, most colleges aren't liberal arts colleges and so they are career focused. Um, I think- significant about this particular liberal arts college is that it's freaking Yale. It's ordered in the city itself. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, it, it has it has branded itself on building leaders. And yeah. a leader has to be an ideas person. They can't be a person, you know, who is solely focused on, you know, the maintenance of a system or even though that may happen or, or just working in it, um, you, you have to be emboldened to, 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 to to at least believe in your ability to trailblaze. And so, um, you know, um, I think Connecticut is, is, has several, has this as the, you know, the flagship institution, but it has several smaller also uh, liberal arts colleges that, 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 that move in the same mantra. And um, those are the schools that to me are, uh, are very promising uh, in working in the prison system. I think that the lag in it is, is only now being addressed because it's such a nuanced thing. You know, um, mm. the CP program being the oldest program in the state at 13 years old, uh, yet quickly falling behind in uh, model. Um, you know, um, comfort works against all of us uh, around these issues. And uh, there are, you know, I, I think YPI has pushed beyond the comfort of just having a program and, and, and educating for the, the sake of educating to understanding the holistic side of, of the university and, and how it should be presented in a prison. Um, I think other schools are starting to, to catch up to that same thought process. You know, you know how they put those banners over, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, Chapel Street or, or York Street, you know, of all kinds, uh, or out on Whitney Avenue. I, maybe, maybe we should put that quote of yours. It's freaking Yale, man, with your <laughs> name, Y-P-E-I, you know. Uh, I don't know, what do you think? You think they do? <laughs> yeah, I don't know how Yale is feel about that. <laughs> I think actually, I mean, I, some people around here have a great sense of humor. They might, yeah. I mean, let's, let's think about that. Uh, Zelda, could, can I get you to just describe a little deeper down, what are these courses like? Who has taught them? Yeah. And how, yeah, you know, thank what, you. What kind of, yeah. It's it's a traditional syllabus, and 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 what? I mean, what what are some of these courses actually like? 
Right. Great question. So all of the classes that we offer are drawn from existing Yale courses. And right. we use the existing syllabi. Um, we, we make sure that every class has the same um, level of rigor, the same expectations, the same structure, the same evaluation rubrics mm -hmm. as those offered on campus. And we don't try to reconfigure them um, to meet what we imagine an incarcerated person might be interested or want uh, to learn about. Uh, what we're extending access to is really the same, the same stuff that we have here on campus, the same level, the same quality, and the same syllabi. Um, and also a really important component of our program is all the instructors are compensated, all the instructors for the credit bearing classes are compensated what they would make teaching on campus. They're fairly compensated. This isn't charity. You know, we see this as being very much within the mission of the college uh, envisioning these students um, in prison as students worthy of the real credit bear, you know, the same syllabi that we um, offer to students on campus. And, and are, faculty, also, are faculty paid by Yale or paid by your program? You have to raise the money or does Yale do it? I'm curious. <laughs> yes, we raise, we raise ah. all of the money. Um, we raise all of the funds to operate this program through private uh, through grants and donations from individuals. Uh, and, and we, you know, we, we pay a, a salary. To, I mean, we pay, we, for the, mm -hmm. we pay everyone something like what they would make teaching on campus, um, to teach that course sure. during summer session, for example. Uh, but we, um, the other thing I just wanted to mention just to touch on, because I was thinking about that liberal arts question and it's such a good question. Um, and it does kind of relate to sort of what the classes look like. Um, but we, you know, when we bring in a, 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 a new class, that's a discipline um, that maybe our students haven't heard of or, or, or don't know much about, um, it really changes. Uh, it really, it really changes the way they see the world and Yale and education. So like, I, I always think back to, you know, the first, when we first brought in those, the, when we first looked at the applicants for our first class, mm -hmm. we always ask this question, what is, um, what is your dream job? What's your highest educational ambition? And the highest educational ambition question is so important because we ask it after asking students educational histories. And when you ask educational ambition after that series of questions, you see people in real time react and, mm -hmm. and give, give themselves greater ambitions. Mm -hmm. um, but for those first questions for what's your, what's your dream job? All, we saw all of these students who wanted to be child, child psychologists. And we were thinking, why, why is that? Um, mm -hmm. And it turned out there had been some sort of volunteer lecturer in the prison a couple months before we turned up. And, all of the students um, inside had been really impressed by it and, and it mm. affected um, their career trajectory. And every class that we bring in, you know, so after that first English class, we did the same survey and we saw that we had students now who wanted to be poets and writers. Um, <laughs> and then the next summer, you know, uh. we had an art class and all of a sudden we had artists. And then, you know, I had a brilliant lecturer from East Asian languages and literature come in. And a lot of the students said, me, I'm not interested, but I'll show up. And, and they went to this incredible lecture called mm -hmm. Decolonizing East Asia. Mm -hmm. And after that, I had East students who still say, I wanna be an East Asian languages and literature major. I wish and the so regular each... Yale students were that, <laughs> were that impressionable. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's, it's very sad, it's, 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 I've had a lot of students who will read, you know, Fanon in a class and feel a sense of sadness that they were never, you know, why wasn't this brought to me earlier in my education? Yeah. Why wasn't I made aware of the range, the, the depth of what happens on this college campus, you know, where I, we have a student who used to sell candy in front of Berkeley College. I had no idea. He said that this is what was going on in Berkeley College. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really something um, that we wrestle with when we're able to, to just bring this exciting, amazing access mm -hmm. to students in mm -hmm. prison. 
um, there's two sides of it. There's there's really, you know, students who are just brilliant and encouraged and become you know ambitious and can kind of see their pathway and their future change before their eyes but who are also really um, disappointed in what their education has brought them so far. How was the reaction of uh, the, the McDougal prison or the Manson facility? How, when you first came and you started this, I know Wesleyan had already been involved, so that might've paved the way for you, but what the officials at the prisons, what were their responses to this? Did they just welcome you with open arms or? lots of suspicion or both or <laughs> mm, that's a good question we had um you know around the time that we first started dreaming this up um you know there were there were two entities to convince there was Yale and there was the department of corrections and um I always joke that you know but it's there's a lot of, it's, I thought the Department of Corrections was going to be hard, but the Department of Corrections was nothing compared to Yale. We <laughs> had at the time a commissioner who, you know, I sat down with him. Um, Hope Metcalf in the law school uh, had arranged a meeting with the commissioner, and you know, I gave him this presentation. This is what I've seen happen at Wesleyan, and this is what the students are like, and this is what we I think we can do if you mm -hmm. gave us you know, the ability to partner. And he just, he stopped me and he said, I have been waiting for someone from Yale to mm. come to me with this idea for years. And mm. I will do whatever it takes and whatever you need uh, to make this happen. I'll come to any meeting, I'll, you know, mm. I'll figure it out. I, I want desperately for Yale to offer this program in our prisons. Um, now that was, you know, Five, six, five, six years ago. And um, it's not always easy. It depends on each facility is kind of its own island. Each prison is its own island with um, different people uh, managing it. And you find some people who really are excited about um, what we can do, uh, how we can change students' lives, how we can bring them home, how we can find pathways uh, for them to college campuses. And then you find others who are really not interested in helping facilitate a Yale program in a prison. Mm -hmm. And that's just part of the course of things. Yeah, well, and the university had to make the decision to give credit, right? Which is always always an issue around universities, I suppose. But but if but but you must have shown the rigor of the courses, the, the fact that you were bringing in real faculty. And somebody, I don't know where, and the dean among the deans or the registrar finally said, "Yes, go for it." I take it, <laughs> but it but it wasn't easy. Zelda, one other question for you, and then I got another one for James at least. Where did this come from in your own education? Art history major at Yale, then law school. I mean, did, did, was this something very early you wanted to get involved with? Was it the mass incarceration phenomenon that drew you? Where did this come from in your own education? Yeah. Um, Where did it come from life? I really, it, well, <laughs> it came from a lot of different places. Um, you know, I, as you mentioned, I have a PhD in art history and right. film and media studies. And I wrote a dissertation about um extras and mm. racial typecasting in early classical hollywood the mm. way that background actors um were classified according to a criminal identification practice um that was drawn from french 19th century you know bertionnage uh, but really it had nothing to do with this i like james mentioned i had a friend from from college who was running this wesleyan program and all of the undergraduates who had been working with her that semester kind of flaked out at the last minute. Mm. Uh, we can't, we, I have too many classes. I can't make it to prison. And um, she asked me <laughs> if I would volunteer to help run I don't have her, time for prison, her study right? halls. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, she asked me if I would, as a graduate student, you know, I was supposed to be finishing my dissertation. So, so I was really happy to, um, you know, find a new distraction. And it was, <laughs> 
not something that I, I ever thought would, you know, I would, that would change my life that I would spend the rest of my life doing. And at the time, Jonathan Holloway was the Dean of Yale college. Right. And I sort of, you know, I had this, how are we going to offer credits? If, if we could build this, if we could get faculty together, if we could get enough support, um, you know, for, for decades, there had been um, Yale faculty and graduate students who had been um, volunteering in prisons in many different capacities, faculty who went in to teach not for credit inside out courses, undergraduates through the undergraduate prison project who volunteer at this um, prison for young adults. But there never been a student in prison who could say that they were a part of a real Yale program with real credits. And, you know, I, and, and I, we figured out a way to really, we had a proposal. This is how we think we can do it. Um, you know, we start with um, classes offered through Yale Summer Session, which already offers uh, credit bearing Yale courses to non matriculated non degree students. And that was really our entree. And um, I honestly thought that I would propose it to Dean Holloway at the time. And and then I would go on the job market and, you know, mm -hmm. find a job and um, not not continue doing this. And it became really clear that if someone didn't hold it together um, and do it, it's too much work for a faculty member. And um, it was going to take too long for any one undergraduate to to sort of see it through. And that's when I met Peter Crumlish, who's the executive director of Dwight Hall at Yale. Mm. And he was really insistent that um, that this project find a home at Dwight Hall and that we continue to really work on making it happen. And that's and then uh, and then right right around that time, um, James got out of prison. And mm. you know, I said, you know, as soon as as soon as we can have James come onto our staff, we need we need James. And so you know, really, I see my job as James has the big vision and I make it happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, we got a really generous grant from a foundation to bring James on in those first years. And now he's just doing the most amazing things at Dwight Hall, everything from, you know, the Civic Allyship Initiative, but James also works a lot on um, voting rights for people who are on parole, as well as working on restoring voting rights for people who are in prison, which you may know in Maine and Vermont, people in prison never lose their voting rights. So we would like for that to happen in Connecticut. James, well, thank you, Zelda. James, could you talk a bit about some of these programs you've now launched through through Dwight Hall, through this prison initiative and other, I didn't know you were working on voting rights as well. And by the way, I just wanted to say your comment earlier, James, about how learning to become a carpenter is a great skill and it could be a profession, but it, as we all know, there've been a few carpenters in history who were also good poets. Um, and, and great philosophers, <laughs> and amazing philosophers. philosophers. Um, uh, I so had a plumber the other day who was, who was he, he just wrote, he went, he saw my book on Douglas. He just wanted to talk about Douglas. I mean, it was amazing. I, I did. I didn't. I never had a conversation with a plumber about Frederick Douglass. It was so cool. Anyway, but talk about some of these other projects that you are now involved in with all of this liberal arts education that you have. Uh, well, I, I guess first, um, I, I educated myself out of any viable stream of employment. So. <laughs> so I couldn't I have the around here I'm a carpenter right or a plumber or um I, I had no trade um I yeah. stay up all night writing papers we didn't have computers we still don't um in the prison system so you know you made requests you read through things you studied the footnotes made more requests you read through more stuff you wrote a paper and you um, wrote with this huh you wrote that. with this yeah wow. um so People don't walk by my cell and be like, what is this going to get you when you come home? Like, what is this going to do for you? Um, well, first I had to get home. You know, so I want to start there. Uh, you know, to me, uh, higher ed in prison is abolition work because I know that when I went to parole, I went with 75 letters of recommendation and character references and support from the world of academia, um, which which played a huge part in my parole hearing. It was um, 
I was the eighth person in the state to go for a new form of parole under juvenile gu uh, guidelines. Uh, if you had caught an adult case as a juvenile, they were instant parole. At, you know, so it, it was very, very new, very nuanced, and very unlikely to 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 receive it. And um, you know, it was hard to argue against my release be, because of uh, the schoolwork, mm. uh, the relationships, relationships that I had built across different campuses um, through a, a higher ed program. Um, but you know, I've been fortunate enough to be home to kind of surround myself in the same type of settings where it's just study and research and writing and strategy and planning. Um, I think at, at the same time that uh, Zelda onboarded me at YPI, um, really, uh, one of my childhood best friends, Kennard Ray, uh, pulled me on as a co-director to the Full Citizens Coalition to unlock the vote, which is how I got involved with the voting rights work. Um, and now we've been doing that together for almost three years now. But being at the White Hall just opened so many uh, doors for me because uh, one, because I, I had this uh, amazing supervisor who would just be like, no, 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 let him do it. So <laughs> that that helps a lot. <laughs> uh, Zelda just let me use the office for whatever was on my mind. Um, mm. and, it, it mm. worked, and she put me in contact with a lot of students uh, at Yup and the Young Dems. And I started, oh, I started uh, onboarding students to do some of the uh, the work that we were doing in New Haven, um, mainly among the young mm. community. Um, uh, I thought it was important that in, in the, the collective voice that, that we were gathering around the parole issue that we got to hear from all sides of community as far as uh, how many people did they know uh, who had been incarcerated and the effects of incarceration. And uh, we used Yale students to talk to the Yale community. Um, but that out of that um, came a lot of robust discussions about yeah, in, in New Haven. And, um, you know, a lot of the young, a lot of the Yale students, the undergrad students just felt like, um, well, New Havers get kind of upset at us when we, when we, when, when we get involved in their elections. And I'm like, no, they, they get upset at you when you tell them who to vote for. Like, you just, this, this city has a history and um, you don't know it to, to lead in discussions of who should be in charge. Uh, but, you're a powerhouse. I, 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 um, I'm late to most scenes uh, in thought. And, you know, it dawned on me around that time, um, just the power of colleges, and especially like in a small state like Connecticut, where you have these built in concentrated hubs of voting power, and it's completely unorganized, not only in, you know, for the very first time in my life, I started wrestling with the theory of, of voting period and, and uh, what part it plays in the American experiment, you know, mm -hmm. as, a, as a structure. And, you know, um, I, think Afri I think those of African descent, um, directly those of slave descent have been destabilized so long, they've never had a chance as a collective to wrestle with the theory of voting. And I think in response to that, the nation has moved to a place where none of us are wrestling the theory. Um, as a collective, um, we're just being pandered. And so, um, you know, well said, well said. <laughs> in, 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 in those conversations, um, uh, I had an idea for a program and, you know, I wrote out a quick rough draft and I gave it to Zelda because that's like, uh, I don't, I don't trust too many editors to just, you know, look past to, to really like chop up what I'm saying. Um, mm -hmm. I think I'm, I've become pretty good with speaking but she doesn't hold any punches. So I, I rely on her to just tell me when it's BS. And um, mm. you know, uh, out of that, we- We all need a good editor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> out of that uh, civic allyship became, um, and, uh, it, it, from, from idea to vision and, you know, Peter uh, saw it and was like, let's, let's give this a shot. Let's see if we can do this here at um, Dwight Hall. And this is our um, inaugural cohort. Um, we're working with a New Haven collaborative project right now on police corruption and prosecutorial uh, and unethical prosecuting in New Haven. It's a timeline uh, that, that uh, mm. showed the structure, the culture of policing and prosecuting um, as the poisonous tree. You know, there's a legal argument of fruit from the poisonous tree. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're doing data mining and, and dossier building on officers and exonerated individuals for us. And we've partnered with uh, Sarah Stillman, journalist class, her journalist uh, 
journalism class and they're doing um, some some investigative journalism work for us on this on this issue. Um, and we're just looking to keep growing that one project, but the, but the the civic allyship in itself is really geared towards uh, aiding and in, in, in allyship, you know, grassroots organizers who don't get the funding, who really have an idea, and sometimes it hasn't moved beyond an idea. Sometimes it's been stagnated for lack of these other things, and we're looking at how do we provide those other things to to keep the vision of the the organizer moving forward. Thanks. Um... I just wanted to point out quickly, and we can maybe some other time come back to it, but uh, the course Zelda that I'd love to come teach for you at some point soon would be this course I do here. It's a seminar on the life and writings of Frederick Douglass. And uh, one of the things that made me think about this, James, is Douglass has so many uses of prison metaphors in his autobiographies. He was, of course, a slave for 20 years. He, he, he would sometimes call it the prison house of slavery, the prison of slavery, the prison like slavery. He was constantly using prison metaphors. And at one point, and you made me think of this in your opening comment, James, Douglas says that while a slave, he remembered while in the prison house of slavery, he said, he always yearned to have a future, a future with hope in it. And, and then the quote goes on about how he's had too much past <laughs> and he yearns to have a future with hope in it. Well, that, that is the same sentiment as I think you expressed that, you know, I guess when you're in prison, it's all about the thing you did in the past. It's all about atoning for that past or paying for that past and so on and so on. And education is, is a future. We, we have so many cliches in this society about education, but this subject shows us it's not a cliche. You know, there's a reason we have public schools and when they work well, if they work well, which they do in some places and they do not in others, then people often come out educated uh, and, then, and then go on. Um, anyway. There's much more to discuss there. We do have some questions coming in, and I might just start with this one if, if either or both of you want to say something on this. Uh, Sheila Haygood writes in, and it's quite personal. She says she has a son in jail, and the system is set up for young men of color to fail. She said, I have been waiting for some help for young men. Thank you all for being good human beings. So I just wanted to tell you that. But she says, you know, her sense of this is that the system has been set up for her son to fail. Uh, how can either of you respond to that? The woman knows what she's talking about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, you know, you can't, you can't build the future in DOC. Yeah. So the system is only set up for you to fail. It's a, you're locked into a charge. You live every day under the scrutiny of never having value. No matter what you do, everything is scrutinized. And I, I was I was put under investig. So so here, um, I had I've had more opportunities in prison than I think most people ever will. Um, at one point, I was a CP student, I, uh, which meant I was always in school. Um, I was in a life program, which meant I had unlimited access to the library. Uh, I was in a choir, so I was at like choir rehearsals with, with the whole prison and singing from the whole prison. Uh, I worked in the commissary, uh, I lived and worked in the commissary unit, which was like mm. a privileged block. So at one point, I was probably out my cell 19 hours a day. Mm. Being out of my cell 19 hours a day put me under investigation. I had too much movement. I had to be doing something illegal. <laughs> So you, you're never beyond uh, suspicion. You're never beyond, you know, yeah. you're, you're tied into something that you just can't break free from. And that, and that affects your, your psyche in a way that um, puts, a, puts some tremendous gaps in you. Um, things that I'm still wrestling with and, 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 and discovering and hurdles that I'm still falling over. So, you know, um, yeah, uh, you know, and, and, and I'll say that higher ed wasn't the answer. It, it, it helped, it helped give me uh, language and, and, and uh, to express some things, but um, 
to tackle the trauma and what prison is, uh, I don't know if anything is, is, is built for that yet. You know, I don't mm. know if there's anything built for that. Um, mm. So the system is very much set up uh, for her son and, and for all men and women in there uh, to fail because it traps you. It traps you and locks you into uh, this, you know, this, mo this moment in your life, this, this, this one moment and that, and that defines you and it plays on your mind in a very um, traumatic way. It, it, it divides you within yourself. Yeah, and Zelda, there's a question here about the, the fact, uh, the idea of when you go to Zoom classes, or if you can, how will that operate in a institution where apparently inmates are not allowed computers? Will this be done on a screen? I don't, I don't know. It's, there's a question here. How do you hope to do that with this new technology, if you can? Yeah, uh, and a, a good question. We are we are exploring the possibility now of setting up remote learning in the prisons. Uh -huh. um, it requires wiring, you know, right now, we, there's no internet in these prisons right now. Um, so they're, they're actually having to install wiring so that we could, um, you know, have a, like a setup in one of the classrooms, turn it into, um, you know, if you can imagine students sitting six feet apart in a classroom because they're brought from um, different units, you know, not all of our students are living in the same unit. They, they come from right. across the prison. And so that's another sort of health risk. Uh, so having masks on and, and doing classes with a faculty member is an option that we're looking ahead to. For the last year, we've been continuing to support students um, entirely by correspondence. If you can imagine, I mean, we, we go to the PO box every day, pick up letters, scan them in, and using a Dropbox system, send them to the faculty that they're intended uh, for. Roderick Ferguson has been leading um, a, a year long seminar uh, on uh, you know black radical thought and they're reading black Marxism and it's it's just it's a it's a it's a very slow system but I will say it, and it's not an elegant system um, but our students have been going through so much trauma and isolation this year that a lot of them have said um, even if they could each have a laptop with wireless internet in their cells which isn't remotely a possibility but even if that that could come to to pass. Um, mm -hmm. People in prison are just not in a headspace to be graded right now, to be you know producing, to be productive. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really, I'm really trying to also set up the remote learning infrastructure with the idea that we also just want to preserve our ability to offer face-to-face -face classes. Mm -hmm. um, there's some concern with the prisons that if you set up a successful remote learning infrastructure and you just don't have to go in to facilitate classes, um, then the prison's just gonna say, great, keep doing it that way. Yeah. Luckily, we, we work with a, a, a deputy warden at the prison we're in where he really believes, you know, this is making an impact for um, people here and we wanna restore face-to-face -face programming as soon as we can. So I don't know, I really look to, I think I read in the Yale Daily News that, uh, Dean of the faculty to Mark Gendler said, we anticipate the fall will be anywhere between 10 and 90% normal. And uh, that's, Which means that's they don't the know same yet. goes for, <laughs> right, same goes for our program. Yeah, well, here's a tough question, James, if you wanna take it. Uh, uh, Tony Nelson writes in and asks, what are your thoughts on the emotional impact on the children of incarcerated parents? Hey, Tony, how you doing? Uh, well, you know Tony, okay. Yeah, I know Tony. Great question. Um, actually, there's somebody else on this uh, chat who I want to reference to, uh, Patrice Collins. She um, uh, okay. co-founded and directs uh, Communities and Family Rising for Justice, which actually works with the children of incarcerated um, oh, good. Uh, okay. individuals. So, you know, I've, I've been working with her in the group for almost two years now. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a it's a community tragedy. Tragedy. Uh, uh, when someone's incarcerated, it 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 has an effect on the entire community, especially on poor communities, which most of people incarcerated come from, uh, especially in Connecticut. Um, and so you see the reverberations of the effects, like when it comes to visiting someone, and and you have a community where seventy percent of people don't have cars, 
or when it comes to certain phone calls, but your community, you have a community where 50% of the community is unemployed, you know? And so all these things have an effect on keeping people in contact, keeping children in touch. And, you know, so much of our culture still uh, operates under the myth. I mean, if you look at the structure of our prisons, they're hidden. You know, they're hidden in small rural towns who benefit from them being there. Mm-hmm. But, but uh, and so we have the, uh, we, 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 we've convinced ourselves that out of sight, out of mind works that, you know, the more contact a child has with a parent in prison, the more they are to repeat. And it's already been proven that that's completely false. That's the more contact they have, the better for their self-confidence, their self-awareness, and to keep them from following their steps. Um, the, the emotional toll is, it, 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 we haven't fully measured the effect in a way that I think we can accept it because it's so, it's so big. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, Tony, you should go with Patrice and, and have this conversation and see how you two can um, aid one another in your efforts. And I would oh. just sort of add in, you know, we, programs like ours, just, just like for any student, enrolling in college at Yale has a generational impact. Mm-hmm. Um, the same goes for enrolling in, in Yale courses in prison. And uh, we've seen of students who, who taking, you know, an advanced sociology seminar changes their relationship with their, with their child, you know, any, any seminar, um, all of a sudden people are talking about their classes with their kids. It's encouraging their kids to, you know, kind of continue their education. Um, all ages, uh, children, children of incarcerated parents of truly all ages, adult children who um, suddenly reconnect with their parents who they haven't seen in years. Um, it also, you know, it just, it, it, it has a tremendous impact uh, at every level. Yeah, well, actually last spring when we were first trying to teach remote to, to your point, Zelda, uh, I was doing my lectures twice a week I was actually videotaping them and then putting them up on the server for a hundred and some students. I started getting emails from the parents because <laughs> they were watching them too. And I, I suddenly had a whole new group of students. It was, it was actually great. And they were telling me about having popcorn with their daughter and watching lectures. And I thought, okay, I, I guess that's a, that's a, you know, value added here to the pandemic teaching, but <laughs> I don't really want to do it forever, but, but you're right. You know, suddenly the parents were involved and, and the student didn't have a choice actually. (laughs) Um, um, Well, uh, there's another question here and this, this can help us begin to wind our way out of this, but uh, perhaps Zelda, you want to go first. Uh, uh, Rachel Lippman writes in and says, what do I, what do YPEI and James new projects most need how can people help well i'll I'll just start by saying uh, anyone out there that wants to help this program i'm sure zelda will be happy to take your call and your contribution and so will the glc by the way if since you asked uh, we are in a major fundraising moment and for several reasons not least of which is our primary funder passed away last year um, and we're going to get involved with YPEI uh, probably within an hour of the end of this program. <laughs> uh, and we actually have a plan, but I'll let Zelda take that one up. Uh, how can people actually help with this project other than writing a check or by writing a check? How, right. how, how do you go for that? Other, yeah, other than definitely donating is one way, but I really, you know, this has been, as you've seen, David, just a massive lobbying effort over the last five years. And it has only succeeded because of the interest of faculty, students, and alumni. And so if you are, you know, and and then, and not just members of the Yale community, but members of the New Haven and Connecticut communities. And so to, you know, there's a, there's a way for everybody to be able to register your support of this program vocally um, and in a way that helps carve out a path for our future. So if you are, you know, an alum, hi, Rachel, uh, I, you know, I would say, you know, talking to, you know, whoever is your contact at the university and alumni are interested in this. We support this. I'm a member of the class of whatever. And, you know, my classmates and I 
want to be able to, you know, we want to be proud of Yale being involved in this program because there has been um, a sort of fear that alumni may not approve of something like this happening at Yale. And so the more that alumni really do speak out and show their support, um, it's going to, it's just going to go a long way for us. For undergraduates, you know, speaking with your professors and trying to get them involved or showing your support um, by getting involved with YEP or reaching out and getting involved with YPEI in different ways. Um, we absolutely welcome you. Um, and for faculty, you know, of course, expressing interest to your chair <laughs> or to, you know, the, the deans and say, I want to teach with YPEI. Is there a way I can get course relief for teaching with this program? Is there um, a way I can apply for some, you know, fun, you know, to really demonstrate that this is something that you want to do and same goes for graduate students um so that's what i would that's what i would say because those voices go a very long way in opening the doors for us and this has not been easy to be able you know many committees upon committees upon committees to get us to where we are and the more faculty who show up um and especially unexpected faculty i feel like a lot of people might know David Blake would be interested in, in teaching this course in prison, but someone who, you know, teaches something that is totally not related yeah. to abolition and slavery to say, you know, I want to be able to understand what impact incarcerated students could have on my campus teaching because it does have a tremendous impact. Didn't you um, even have a physics course? Well. Didn't you even have a physics yes. course? Yeah, yeah. Yes, With no lab Tifton, or anything. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, By the way, we have we, uh, and an amazing one. We have an alumni, an alum who just wrote in. Brandon Weaver uh, wants to know any suggestions about finding other sites around the country. He gets more specific. Um, he said he's a Yale alumnus. He wants to help out these programs, especially in the D.C. Baltimore area. Now, this may be somebody else you guys know already. I don't know. Um, I, I want to chime in real quick. Go uh, ahead. To Rachel Littman. Um, <laughs> sure, so sure. Uh, I have a very new program at, at Dwight Hall uh, that actually needs checks. So um, <laughs> more than staff, like we, we need to raise money. So um, uh, in order to allow this program to gain legs and to what I really believe to do some really amazing work uh, and create a uh, much more well-rounded uh, future leaders um, who have uh, uh, a direct understanding of what has happened on the ground, um, the way policy plays out um, and, and affects uh, marginalized communities, um, then the program has to be stabilized. So we're, we're at a very early stage where alum, alumnus who support the program uh, financially is, is, is like a, a big deal for us right now. Okay. Um, and I'll jump in and answer Brandon's question. Um, sure. And this is this is like great. I, I I think one of the best parts of my of my job in these last couple of years has been answering calls from other programs getting started across the country, and you know, people. I just got a call, you know, from the provost at Stanford. How do we create something like YPEI at our university? Um, yeah. How do we how do how do we kind of take what you've done? Like how do we navigate? Um, the institution in this way. And I will say that actually there's a fantastic program um, out of Georgetown called the uh, Prisons and Justice Initiative that's actually, that was founded by another Yale alum, Mark there Howard. You go. Um, the Yale diaspora, I there don't you go. know what year he was, <laughs> uh, but definitely look into that program. Um, and there is actually a national um, Alliance uh, for Higher Education in Prison, and they have an online directory where you can kind of look, click on your state and see what programs are nearby and what are ways I can get involved. Well, we're gonna put up our website and so forth at the very end. And I think Michelle has already put yours in the, either the chat or the Q and A. Um, but there's a couple last questions here. Uh, Charlotte White writes in and asks, any plans to offer courses to women at the York Correctional Institution? Um, I, was, I was actually just typing the answer, but, but oh, okay. Wesleyan, <laughs> Trinity, and Quinnipiac all offer their programs to women at York CI. And so, you know, this is, it, it okay. kind of yeah. goes to an interesting question because we're really, we're just limited by, you know, funding and classroom spaces in the sure. prison. And so if a facility has plenty of programming and, and not enough classroom spaces for the current programs, then 
there's really no need for us to go there. There's 14 other prisons that, that need um, college programming. Sure. Well, you know, Zelda, you may be consulting uh, around the country on this question the rest of your days if you choose to. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the GLC here at Yale 22 years ago was the first such institute to study slavery and abolition at a university. There are now at least four or five others, two in England, one in Canada, two in the U.S., with similar missions, similar definitions. And, uh, uh, you know, one thing always leads to another. To a, a good idea won't stay in one place. Uh, but, but, you know, to James's point, what's, what's so invisible about prisons, right? I mean, they're, all, they're all usually in these small towns. Um, and it's got something to do with the voting rights question, too, doesn't it? Because to, to most of us, to vast majority of Americans, they probably don't know formerly incarcerated people. They, they don't, they don't, no one visits prisons if they don't have to, right? And... So it's an invisible problem, even though it's millions of people, you know, denied the right to vote. Um, it, 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 this is this in, and you know, we're always going to be up against it in that sense. There's the invisibility of this, but the more and more and more visibility that a place like Yale can can, you know, it, it, it's friggin' Yale is or freaking Yale is, as James said, <laughs> can bring to this, all the better. Um, you know, I just want to, I mean, I just want to say once again, this has just been one of the best arguments I've ever heard for what I've, I guess, so many of us have been talking about all of our lives. And that is the, the very function of this thing we do called education, especially in the liberal arts. And liberal arts, of course, includes the sciences. Um, this, is why, this is why we read literature. This is why we do history. This is why we read poetry. Um, I'm sitting here in the Beinecke studying a great poet, James Walden Johnson. And um, at some point, I'd love to maybe do a lecture on Johnson. And that guy was amazing. He was a polymath. Um, and his papers are all right here. What if we could bring James and a group of other students at some point here and let them actually see and hold these documents in this, in this incredibly special place. Um, well, what a thrill that would, just to hold those documents. I, I do institutes with high school teachers virtually every summer, and their biggest thrill about coming here for a whole week is not listening to me. Uh, it's coming into this library and holding documents. They go crazy over that, because they never get to do that. They've never seen original documents, you know put on the gloves and you get to touch them and hold them and even take some pictures of them. So maybe, 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 maybe down the road that can even happen here. I, I can't speak for the library, but I can at least speak for the desire. Um, but final comments from both of you. Uh, uh, anything else you'd, you'd love to say about this initiative, this project at this point? I know Zelda, you've you, you're, you're going to expand, and we, we want to try to create a fellowship between the GLC and the uh, Yale Prison Initiative that would be yeah. a former incarcerated person with a degree who would apply, same process, you, you apply, you know, th this project gets judged over that one or whatever, but you come here, we give you a desk, you have an office, you get all access to libraries, and by God, you get a chance to write something. I think it'd be a great thing to attempt to do. I, I can't, I can't wait, and we are gonna, we are gonna do this. Um, and I'll just say, yeah, um, in, in, you know, a couple of sort of closing thoughts. Right now, we're really focused on, you know, we mentioned the pandemic and setting up remote learning. We're also, we're really focused on, um, we're creating a partnership this year uh, for a degree to begin to um, partner to offer uh, degrees in prison uh, through a partner institution. Um, and we're also, you know, we're looking to expand, to increase our impact, to have more courses, year round courses, to work with more students. Um, and, you know, we're, we're also, just thinking about the different ways that a university, and this has just become really clear in the last year, the different ways that a university can really 
provide a lifeline for students in prison, both inside and coming home. And uh, this is kind of a, a crucial moment for our program. We've been kind of fighting for this program to exist for a long time. And I think we're looking ahead um, at ways we can expand at the ways a program like this answers um, a lot of a lot of questions, a lot of problems, a lot of injustices uh, that we're seeing right now. Um, and I also, uh, you know, I really, when, when, when doing this work, I center, um, I center all of my thinking on actually um, the Yale mission statement, which I, I feel like I ever, probably half the people in, in this um, webinar have, have heard me quote the Yale mission statement before. Um, but the message that I'd like to most leave everyone with. Most people never read it, though. Most people never read it, as you know. <laughs> well, it's taped right here above my desk. Um, but, you know, the mission of Yale College is to seek extraordinarily promising students from all over the country and to educate, from all over the world, rather, sorry, and to educate them with the aim of cultivating future leaders and citizens. And so what we're doing here is, without changing a word of the Yale mission statement, is we're, you know, we're looking at that verb to seek. We're seeking extraordinary, extraordinarily promising students in unconventional places. And, you know, Yale admissions sends out delegates all over the world to find these extraordinarily promising students. And we're making the argument that they're actually just as promising students right here in our state prisons who have been, you know, over-policed, disenfranchised by the university um, in different ways, who live in our community, who come from our community, and one, you know, and, and we see a lot of times people calling on Yale to, to act um, against injustices or to serve the community in different ways. And we believe powerfully that this is one way that the university can do this through teaching power, through what we do on campus, through teaching power and through the liberal arts and by extending you know, equitable access to education and high quality, the same high quality education, um, rigorous education that we offer to the students who walk on our campus. Um, and, you know, we believe that you can do all of that without changing a word of the Yale mission statement, that it's all right in there. And, you know, like, like a, any good Yaley, uh, it's, it's all about the close analysis. <laughs> <laughs> You did a close reading of the mission statement. Huh? I, I can, Every day. That's funny because I can add to that that when I was on the Calhoun College renaming committee four or five years ago now, that mission statement was very useful to some of the conclusions we reached. I, I'll just leave it it's, there, but but I'm glad Yale had just rewritten important. its mission statement because it was actually quite useful. <laughs> I mean, it's it's also really powerful to think about you know, the mission is creating future leaders and citizens. And so, I mean, we talk about this all the time, but if, if you, if you, um, you know, if you think, if you can think, if you can imagine a post-carceral abolitionist future, then you have to be able to imagine that students who are currently incarcerated, who have the experience of these injustices in the system will be the leaders of that future. And so our, our responsibility as a university is to invest in those current students, future leaders, future citizens, current That's citizens, good. future James, leaders. any last comment and then we'll close it out. Uh, yeah, so, um, well, Zelda gave the, the best pitch. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna give uh, something a little more, uh, well, it's gonna be different. Um, I'm a New Haven native. Uh, what I know of Connecticut, what I know of New Haven and Yale is that uh, during my lifetime and my, my upbringing, New Haven had the highest conviction rate in the state. And thus it drove the state's conviction rate because the state's attorney's office is an extremely competitive office. You can't be losing cases when someone else is winning cases. You won't, and, and you know, part of the high conviction rate in New Haven is Yale's presence. It is hard mm -hmm. to send kids to a city that has been, that is on the, the, one of the 25 most violent cities in the nation. Mm -hmm. It's a poor city in the middle of a lot of wealth. Um, it's hard to send your child there with, without certain, uh, certain things that of, of comfort. Um, doesn't mean those things uh, were reached in a very fair or just way. 
And so um, when I think about uh, Yale and this program, I think about what the city has already lost and, and what this program has the ability to give back to the state. Um, out of all the satellite schools, that uh, campuses that Yale has, I think the one at McDougal and wherever else YPI expands to are the crown jewels of satellite locations. I, I, I grew up in prison and I grew up around brilliance. It's just hidden. Um, and I'm, I'm not you know, special, I'm just the first one to come home from amongst those who I was surrounded by. Um, I was a lifer, which meant that I wasn't, it wasn't meant for me to come home anytime soon. Um, yet, you know, the ability to, to educate myself and to find um, alliance and support within these, these, these networks you know, has allowed uh, me to move into the position of leadership and to, uh, to really grow my, my imagination. And um, I think that's what this program, I know what, that that's what this program is offering. Um, in a way right now that no other program of the state is offering it. And, and, and Yale, Yale itself though, hasn't earned the right to what will come yet. Like uh, I, I came through Wesleyan. Wesleyan has not earned the right to attach itself to my success. Hmm. Um, my benefit from them ended with my education. Their benefit from me has continued without support. And you know that's just a failure of the program to move past the comfortable and figure out exactly what it is they want to do. And not the program itself, but the institution of Wesleyan. So you know I definitely uh, look for more Yale support for more departments and for more administration to come on board with this program. So you can actually earn the right to attach yourself to the brilliance that is gonna come out of this program because it, it, it's coming. You know, uh, I, like I said, I wasn't set to come home for the 10 years. The laws changed, that's it, laws changed, which released me and the work and preparation that I had been doing showed up. There are guys doing the work who are committed to their transformation and, and you know, their communities and the world will benefit from it. And so will Yale, but Yale needs to earn that by supporting this program a lot more. Well, thank you, both of you, uh, James and Zelda, uh, for this uh, terrific session. It has been, as Zelda pointed out, a harrowing week, uh, month, year, uh, both here and uh, across the country, across the world. Yale did have another terrible tragedy of its own just this week which we don't need to go into. Um, but uh, you just uplifted us though about a, a problem that is uh, not always so uplifting. And uh, you guys are all about possibilities. You're all about future. You're all about the promises, but you're also about what a humanities, liberal arts education ultimately means. It's the same thing as what democracy ultimately means. It's for the brain, the soul, the spirit, uh, the whole of us. Um, and uh, I'm just so glad we did this session. We had a great audience, great questions. And I think Daniel is gonna put up, uh, I don't know, a, a flyer here at the end that will show a website and so forth. There you are. And uh, uh, again, Zelda, James, thanks, thanks so much for, let's get together in person by this summer somewhere, okay? And Zelda will talk. Life and Life and Writings of Frederick Douglass. It's a course. I, I can send you the syllabus right now. Uh, I'm sold. We'll do it. He as wrote millions of words, so there's a lot to read. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Thanks, and thanks everybody for attending today, and uh, have a great Wednesday. <laughs>